I'm Alex Michaels, and this week the issue is Governor Newsom fighting back. I love our values, and I'm gonna fight like hell to protect them. We're one-on-one -on -one with him as he hits the campaign trail for the first time, urging a no on the recall. What's his strategy, and what's his message for critics? Plus, that's bull and we gotta call it that. And you also said it's bull I did, because it is. Republican frontrunner Larry Elder under fire from the left and the right for his comments about women. But do voters actually care? Quite the panel this week, Gustavo Ariano of the LA Times, Dan Schnur from USC, and Susan Shelley from the OC Register. The issue is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, California's only statewide political show. You're watching The Issue Is. Welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michaels, and on a busy week, Governor Newsom hitting the campaign trail hoping to motivate Democrats. Let's vote no on this recall. Let's vote no. We were on hand with the governor in commerce as he rallied with SEIU employees. Unions will be key for getting people to the polls. They've already donated millions to him. Another key constituency, Latino voters, who the governor has struggled to win over. We were with him at a Mexican restaurant in El Sereno as he greeted volunteers and spoke with us. Governor, welcome back to The Issue Is. Good to be here. Good to see you. Good to be back. So the state of the recall race, how do you see it right now? How do you see this race? Well, we turn out our vote, we're going to win uh, overwhelmingly. We just have to remind people the imperative of the vote no on the question uh, that is in front of them. And I say in front of them because this is an all mail-in ballot. It's very different. It's an off year, off month. It, it happens on September 14th, but at the end of the day, the election day is every single day between now and September 14th. It's all about turnout. And you say that Larry Elder is the clear favorite on the other side. Yeah. Uh, well, so I, I think there are a lot of people that have asked me, how much can a governor really do in a year with a Democratic supermajority? Uh, What's the answer to that? I mean, you can lie down and veto everything coming out of the legislature. You can veto everything that comes from the legislature. But there's uh, a veto-proof uh, majority, well, right? There is and there isn't. A lot of things are stubborn. There's a lot of diversity even within the Democratic caucus. At the end of the day, you could start to vandalize all the executive orders. You can eliminate the masking requirement for public schools. You can eliminate the vaccine requirements for public health care workers. So many of the things that I signed through executive order can be done overnight. You can appoint judges without any oversight and consideration. That's, that's going to have an impact for years and years and years. If there's a vacancy, and you've seen many vacancies, Secretary of State, U.S. Senator, you've seen an Attorney General, you appoint. County Board of Supervisors. I appoint half a dozen. Uh, you will be able to appoint people that will permanently have that opportunity uh, to represent. So it is a profound consequence. And also you have the bully pulpit of the fifth largest economy in the world. And you have a midterm election coming up with another Californian uh, who wants to take out Nancy Pelosi. Consequences are pretty extraordinary. So in terms of sort of where we go from here, the LA Times has this op-ed that says that it would be a disaster if uh, you were recalled. But they also said it would be cowardly not to vote on question number two. They make the point that there's a big difference between Larry Elder and Kevin Faulkner. I don't know. You don't think so? I don't you, don't, you don't think there's a difference between Larry Elder and Kevin Faulkner? I don't know. You have to ask them. I mean, they seem to align on the masking. They seem to align on the vaccine verification. They align in terms of their support of Donald Trump. So I don't honestly know. I mean, the, look at where they are on the critical issue of this Delta variant and keeping people healthy and keeping people safe as it relates to this virus. They are both promoting exact same position, walking off a COVID cliff and following the Ron DeSantos uh, and the Texas model. So uh, I, I would uh, suggest they're much more similar than they appear. But, but is there something though of giving up your vote, giving up your say in that? And then a, a real small minority of voters, you're, you're essentially letting the Republicans pick the next governor. No, I mean, no look, th th this thing up or down, we could reject, you don't have to worry about the second question. I mean, the clarity of this is pretty simple. You vote no, we don't have to even worry about the second question. Just vote no. Uh, and then next year, we can have at it and we can go back and forth with 40, 50, 60, 70 candidates in a traditional election. But they want to shortchange that. This isn't just Republicans that supported this recall. There are Democrats that signed it as well, overwhelmingly Republicans, but there are Democrats, there are independents that are frustrated by what's happened in this state, that are considering voting for this recall right now. Do you understand why they're frustrated? And what's your message to the them? The last year and a half, we've all been frustrated. The whole tremendous fear and anxiety all of us have been faced with across the country. 
There's not a state and no one in positions of influence or leadership is, is not struggling uh, with everybody's anxieties. And you have to be empathetic in that respect. But also you have to be sort of mindful that there's a reason the RNC is behind this and Newt Gingrich is behind this and folks like Devin Nunes are behind this. At the same time, look, I deeply understand the difficulty and challenges we've been through as a state, but boy, we are turning the state around, outperforming across the spectrum across the economic and health spectrum compared to other states and the best is yet to come. Well, and let's just paint a real clear picture of that. So the next year, because that's all this is going to be basically, what does that look like with you? What's the agenda for the next year with you as compared to with one of the others? We just put together a comprehensive detailed strategy of first in state's history to deal with the issue that's probably the most frustrating and vexing issue of our times, and that's homelessness. A $12 billion plan, $3 billion for new mental health housing for conservatorships and to place people that are severely mentally ill, get them off the streets, an encampment strategy to address all these encampments. We haven't been shy. A $3.75 billion commitment on affordable housing a housing agenda likes of which we've never had. Cleaning up our streets, we're transforming our public education system, and we are combating climate change, leading the nation in terms of our low carbon strategy. So I think a lot is at stake. All of that gets set back, right. quite literally, in many cases, reversed if we don't turn out and vote no on the recall. Do you think there are any legitimate grievances that people have? And are there any lessons maybe you've learned from the last year, maybe things that didn't go so well that you want to do differently now going forward. The state forward. of California outperformed Texas and Florida, Indiana and the United States in terms of health outcomes and economic outcomes. Look, in hindsight, all of us, there was no playbook for any governor, not right. one in this country. Every single person in position of leadership, um, business leaders, parents, all of us, I imagine, could go back and say, how would I approach things if we knew now or then rather what we know now and so uh, it's always difficult to assess that but humility always no one's ideological here and i recognize what everyone recognized all those pre-existing conditions don't think for a second i mean are just two and a half years we just got with the last year and a half kind of a little sidetracked in terms of the fundamental agenda of addressing affordability and dealing with homelessness and what's happening on the streets and also addressing some of the crime issues in the state which i'm committed to and resolved to do and we have strategies and we are not walking away from responsibility in that space either and we we saw you fired up in one of the recent interviews that got a lot of attention I know this last year has been so incredibly taxing for you personally, every single day, the pressure of the pandemic and everything. Stressful for everybody all, all around the state, but especially for you with the pressure of all this. Is it frustrating though, after doing all of that work every day to then have to face this? I mean, that, nothing is enjoyable about facing this recall, but I don't know if there's anything I could have done to avoid it at the end of the day. Again, this predate, predates the damn pandemic. Uh, these guys are coming. This is the sixth effort. And we're just at a moment in American history with the easiest recall uh, ballot to get on uh, in America, where it takes a few million dollars and a little intentionality to get it done. So look, yeah, it's, I got four kids. I mean, you want the stress I have is replicated by millions of other families with kids. And that's the hardest part. And they're young. They're all of them under the age of 11. You know, the youngest just turned five. And you know, dealing with family and the responsibilities, and dealing with pandemic. I have small businesses myself. Uh, you know, that's, that's how I got into politics as a small business owner. Uh, all of this across the spectrum. And you know, end of the day, no one cares about. I know what people think about. I'm not naive. Yeah. We love to hate politicians. Yeah. We're just things. We, you know. So look, no one has to worry about my feelings. My job is to worry about your feelings. And. 40 million Californians. And you know what? I care about all 40 million. I care about the people that signed the petition. I care about Republicans, not just Democrats. I care about people living in rural California. I care about people that go to church. I care about people that believe in their right uh, to bear arms. I believe that people have the ability to live together across their differences. I love this state. I love what it represents. I love our values. And, and I'm gonna fight like hell to protect them. And that's why I want people to vote no on this recall. Governor Gavin Newsom, thank you for the time. Thank Appreciate you. it. Always Appreciate great it. to see you. Our thanks to the governor. This week, the recall race jumped into the fast lane. So much to break down with our panel. Gustavo Ariano, Dan Schnur, Susan Shelley, they're all ready to go. They're ready to dance. They're next.
Kamala Harris is homegrown. The vice president will be back in the Bay Area on Friday to campaign for Governor Newsom at a precarious time for both Northern California politicians. Let's talk about that and more with our panel this week, all of them returning champions. Gustavo Ariano is a columnist with the Los Angeles Times and host of the Times podcast. His column this week is entitled, Sorry Democrats, Latino anger towards Republican isn't enough to save Newsom's political hide. Dan Schnur has practiced politics at the highest levels, both nationally and here in California, and taught at the highest levels as well. He's been a professor at UC Berkeley, Pepperdine, and USC, where he once taught me. Susan Shelley has never been my professor. She's a member of the editorial board of the Southern California News Group, 11 daily newspapers, including the LA Daily News, the Orange County Register. This week, they endorsed the recall of Gavin Newsom and chose Larry Elder as his replacement. Welcome back to The Issue Is, all of you. Uh, Dan, let's start with you. How would you assess the state of the recall race and what you just heard from Governor Newsom? Uh, at this point, Alex, the state of the recall race uh, has been track is tracking, as it has been for a year now, with the state of COVID. This spring, when it looked like the world was opening up again, Newsom began to look stronger, too. And now, thanks to the Delta variant, now that we're heading back into more challenging circumstances, so is Gavin Newsom. And Gustavo, recent polls suggest the governor is struggling to win over Latinos most of all. Why do you think that is? And what can he do to change that? Latinos have been, of course, uh, disproportionately affected by the pandemic, and there is that fatigue. And there's also, let's admit, there's an increasing number of Latinos who are finally fed up with the Democratic Party, who all they, even though they've given them all these programs ostensibly, they are tired of hearing the Republicans are evil, the Republicans are out to get you. He needs to offer Latinos hope. He cannot offer them doom and gloom. We've already seen doom and gloom, and we don't like doom and gloom. Give Latinos hope. And Susan, there are a lot more Democrats in California, twice as many Democratic voters, but polls shows that Republicans way more fired up about the recall. How are you feeling about the chances to actually pull this off? Well, I don't know more than the pollsters do, but the governor certainly looks nervous and uh, it certainly appears that this is going to be a nail biter on election night. But it's not just Republicans. It's also that he signed AB5, which made freelancing illegal in California. It's a crime to hire independent contractors. A lot of Democrats were affected by that. A lot of freelancers in the entertainment industry affected by that and not happy. It's all the angry parents who don't like the way he handled the schools and the deferring to the unions about school reopening decisions. A lot of angry people, not just Republicans. Uh, Dan, I know the governor has been excited about the possibility of Kamala Harris and Joe Biden coming basically to save the day. What sort of impact does Kamala Harris's visit make and does the Afghanistan situation make it less of an impact? I don't know how much of an impact Harris is going to have. I think what the Newsom campaign realized early on is in order to motivate the Democratic base to turn out, there's not much they can tell them about Newsom's record that's going to get progressive Democrats that excited. So there's two alternatives. One alternative, as you just mentioned, Alex, is to nationalize the election and essentially say to Democrats, hey, you might not love Newsom, but there's much bigger national stakes involved here. The other way of doing it, as Gustavo mentioned, if you can't get people excited about your own candidate, you frighten them about the other side. And if Larry Elder did not exist, Gavin Newsom would have had to invent him because what Newsom's message has now become at this point is essentially, you may not love me, but do you really want any of these people, especially that guy Elder, to replace me? Susan, do you think that Joe Biden still ends up coming here with everything else that's going on? No, I think that ship has sailed with the, with the catastrophe in Afghanistan. I think uh, his endorsement would not be helpful and it wouldn't look good for him at this time to be campaigning in California. I think, I think he probably will not come. And Gustavo, an, an interesting question is, what do we do about question two on the ballot, even for Democrats or people like you that uh, don't want there to be a recall? You know, Governor Newsom saying to me, well, don't even worry about it, don't think about it, saying that there's, he, he doesn't see a difference between Larry Elder and Kevin Faulkner. What do you say about that? 
What, you go for that TikTok YouTube personality whose name I forget right now? Or do you go for someone who's viable and get and tell every single Democrat, okay, like we got to run for this. Like you want to talk about voting for someone you don't like? This is the time because otherwise we're going to have Larry Elder and we're doomed. By the way, his name is Kevin Pathraff. Uh, or I'm, me, I'm old, me, so I don't know Kevin, that like you, Alex. As, Sorry. as he's known. Dan, to wrap up with you, do you think that that's a mistake, the Democratic strategy when it comes to question two? It's a mistake on strategy, and more important than that, it's a mistake in terms of democracy, Alex. Reasonable people can disagree on whether Newsom should be recalled from office or not. But for the governor to say, don't even bother to vote for my potential replacement, is an abdication of leadership. He's essentially saying, if I can't keep my job, I don't care what happens at the state of California. That's unfortunate. I hope he changes his mind between now and September 14th in order to give his supporters some guidance and direction for what life might be like if he is recalled. More with our panel after the break. As we listen to some music from Prince, Why Don't You Call Me Anymore? This week, Larry Elder is under fire from his ex. Uh, this is his ex fiance his ex-producer, making explosive allegations against him. He is denying it, but what's the political fallout of all that? That's next. I still got the fire. My experience with Larry Elder is, is that he lacks impulse control and he's dangerous. Larry Elder responding to his ex fiance claiming he waved a gun at her while high. He says, quote, I've never brandished a gun at anyone. I grew up in South Central. I know exactly how destructive this type of behavior is. It's not me, and everyone who knows me knows it's not me. These are salacious allegations. More with our panel, uh, Dan Schnur of USC, Gustavo Ariano of the LA Times, and Susan Shelley of the Orange County Register. Larry Elder also coming under fire for a column that he wrote in 2000 in Capitalism Magazine. We want to put it up on the screen. He wrote, quote, women know less about men then men about political issues, economics, and current events. He said that a study at the Annenberg School at the University of Pennsylvania confirmed women's lack of knowledge of the issues. Here's what former San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner told me about that by phone this week. That's bull and we gotta call it that. And you also said it's bull I did, because it is. He doesn't want to defend this. Uh, it's indefensible. Faulkner making that point at a debate as well. Susan Shelley, your board endorsed Elder. You interviewed him for that endorsement. Why are you backing him? And does this change your view of him at all? Well, first, let me say that he was commenting on a survey of women and what they knew about the issues in terms of elections, in terms of campaigns, not individual women, but women as a voting bloc. And he was commenting on a study that said that. So I, I think that that's... That's not really a fair charge against him. And what I perceived was no sexism at all from him. I certainly did not perceive that he did not respect the opinion of women or thought that women had less knowledge of, of current events. That was certainly not my impression on our, on our call. I, I detected no trace of sexism. And the reason that we endorsed him is we felt that he would use the bully pulpit very effectively in a one-year term to elevate some of the issues and some of the solutions to problems in California. Uh, Gustavo, what do you make of, of all of this? Does, does it hurt him? Oh, no. The elder dodos are going to be following him no matter what he does. His fans are not going to pay attention. At the end, they don't even care so much about Larry as they care about removing Gavin Newsom. The more bad things you say about Larry, the more his fans are going to love him. Well, and, and Dan, that is kind of what happened with Donald Trump, right? Uh, because every time that he was attacked by the media or by his opponents, he made it saying, they're attacking you because they're trying to stop me. In reality, they're trying to stop you. And it seems like Larry Elder is taking the same approach. Elder is taking the same approach. You're exactly right, Alex. This isn't as much politics as it is arithmetic. In a regular election, you need 51% of the vote to win. In order to win the second question on the recall ballot, you probably only need about 20 or 25%. And that's a very devoted core. But the only person who's happier about Elder's success than Elder is Newsom, because the stronger Elder gets is the potential replacement for Newsom. On the second question, the better Newsom's odds get to beat the recall on the first question. But a pot potential counter to that, Susan, is that Larry Elder also is exciting the Republican base. 
and bringing people together in a way that somebody like Kevin Faulkner has not demonstrated an ability to do. What do you make, Susan, of Kevin Faulkner's strategy to now go after Elder, the Republican frontrunner, in such an aggressive way, saying it, he's basically BS? Well, he's someone whose plans have been upended by the entrance of Larry Elder into the race. Uh, Elder raised more money, got more support, got more delegate signatures toward an endorsement. The Republican Party didn't make an endorsement. That in itself was a repudiation of Kevin Faulkner, who had been counting on it. Uh, there's no question that the 2022 race has started. This is the Republican primary for 2022. And I think Kevin Faulkner is hoping to clear the field and try again. All right. Uh, our thanks to our panel. You guys are all great. I wish we could talk to you all day. Hope to see you all again soon. Up next, Republican candidate John Cox accused of stealing money in the middle of a debate. It's one of the most bizarre moments in California political history. And it's next. Did you steal my money? Next week on The Issue is a debate about the recall, vaccine mandates, and more with Tommy Lahren on the right and Ethan Bierman on the left. That's going to be fun. We end this week with some surreal moments involving Republican candidate for Governor John Cox. Of course, he has made a bear the centerpiece of his campaign and nicknamed himself the Beast. Well, during a debate this week, check out his mask. Yeah, that's right. It's the face of a bear. Then there's this tweet from Melody Gutierrez of the LA Times. This is how the Sacramento Press Club debate started. Hey, Mr. Cox, your time starts now. I want to give a shout out first to my John fellow Cox, you've been defenders, man. San Diego Superior Court. Yeah, he was served with papers. Cox's former campaign consultants from 2018 say he owes them $100,000 and refuses to pay it. We hope that everyone gets the money they deserve and it all works out. Let's end, though, by having a little fun with all of this. I'm Alex Michael, so thanks for watching. The Issue is Steve Miller Band. Play us out.